it's memories we still have. Do you remember carrying that rug down in the women's studies room? And <laughs> so, you know, it was a wonderful, wonderful that women's, women's center um, experience. And I, it probably was a high point in my career, being involved in that. So women's studies came along at the right time for me. <laughs> when it really matters, um, people come together because of their commitment to the kinds of things that Women and Gender Studies does and the things that it stands for. At the same time, there's always this struggle for Women's and Gender Studies to be part of that institution. It wants to be part of the institution while at the same time challenging it. And that's the dichotomy that creates the friction and makes it very difficult. But it's also what's so important for students to see, that there are, there is a space on campus in some programs to think outside of the institutional box. The Women and Gender Studies Colloquium Series, that began, that was hosted in the Women and Gender in, in the Women's Center. And I think the Women's Center provided a place for that to happen because there was no office or, you know, there was no formal space for women in gender studies. And so I think the Women's Center provided that, the space for that to happen. So I found the knowledge very heavy at sometimes, but then I would tell myself, no, Sylvia, there's been enough struggle for women. You have to tell your students there has to be joy in the struggle or the struggle is not for you. And of course, none of us could do this work without the energy and excitement and commitment of students to really see the value in what we do here at MSUM. Because I think a lot of people would come in talking about not only what they were learning in Women and Gender Studies, but also questioning some of the things they were learning in other classes and making connections to things they might have been hearing in their Women and Gender Studies classes and how that might have differed in their other classes or how they make sense of it. And all of that discussion happened in the Women's Center. I think Women's Studies, Women and Gender Studies is scrappy. And <laughs> that um, it will continue to be at MSUM and it will continue to thrive. Welcome. My name is Kristen Maple Bloomberg, and I am professor of women's studies at Hamlin University in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I also hold the Hamlin University Endowed Chair in the Humanities. Today, I present the lecture to add a glory to the common life, 19th century Methodism and women's collegiate education, which is based in part on research that was completed for the article, 19th century Methodists and co-education, the case of Hamlin University which was published in the October 2008 edition of Methodist History. That article is available for download from the General Commissions on Archives and History of the United Methodist Church via the Methodist History Journal at archives.gcah.org. Inherited from his mother, Susanna, who believed in educating both her daughters and sons, John Wesley believed in education and its use as a tool for social reform. In the mid-19th century, American Methodists answered the need for collegiate and college preparatory education. Their schools were created with a specific social project in mind, namely to create a literate body of rational evangelical Christian women and men who would provide moral and spiritual leadership needed in American society. The Methodist project of higher education focused on settlements along the emerging western frontier where the need for colleges was greater and class mobility more rapid. Methodists were also intent on bringing religion, morality, and literacy to what some believed was the disorder of the frontier 
and a population ripe for evangelizing. Methodist Episcopal Bishop Leonidas L. Hamlin, the man responsible for providing the initial funding for Hamlin University, believed that the frontier was an appropriate place for establishing a new church-sponsored institution of higher learning. He said, female education is exciting unprecedented interest in the West, and conventions and colleges of teachers are discussing it with extreme earnestness and zeal. He said that in 1840. A few years later then, in 1854, the eponymous Hamlin University was established at the eastern edge of Minnesota Territory under the auspices of the Methodist Episcopal Church. In order to explore the ideas foundational to the Methodist support of co-education, we need to turn to the Ladies' Repository, the Methodist Journal for Women published between 1841 and 1878, which featured the writings of prominent Methodist men who were in favor of women's equal participation in the Methodist Episcopal project of social leadership and reform. The Ladies' Repository was a monthly periodical based in Cincinnati and produced by the Methodist Episcopal Church. It was devoted to the literature, arts, and doctrines of Methodism and contained a variety of content, such as articles, poetry, fiction, engravings, etc. Its founding editor was Bishop Hamlin, who held that post from 1841 to 1844. 19th century Methodists underscored rationality and social functionality in learning, distinguishing it from women's ornamental education in needlework, music and dancing, reading, and the study of French or Italian designed to prepare young women for marriage. This type of education was, in the Methodist view, simply a waste of women's intellectual and spiritual powers, condemning her to a sinful life of disuse and rendering her incapable of understanding the dynamic complexities of God's world 